History as it happens, May 26, 2022. NATO forever. If Greece should fall under the control of an armed minority, the effect upon its neighbor Turkey would be immediate and serious. We will now proceed to the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty. Men with courage and vision can still determine their own destiny. They can choose slavery or freedom, war or peace. The passion for freedom cannot be denied forever. The world has waited long enough. The time is right. Let Europe be whole and free. 70 years after joining NATO, Turkey opposes membership for Sweden and Finland. Those two historically neutral countries, because of the war in Ukraine, are seeking to join an alliance whose only Asian member, Turkey, has drawn closer to Russia. If Cold War dreams of a Europe whole and free are on the line in Ukraine, Turkey has issues that need to be resolved too. And that's next, as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. So we say to Prime Minister Orban, President Havel, President Kwasniewski, Welcome to NATO. Welcome home to the community of freedom. Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Two proud independent countries. Romania. Exercising the sovereign right all states possess to decide their own security. I think that Sweden and Finland are going to do everything they can to sort of break this logjam. I think there'll be heavy pressure from the larger states in the alliance to uh, resolve Turkish concerns and try and move this forward. You know, if you listen to presidential speeches over the past, say, 75 years, you'll notice how often they echo. They rhyme, if not repeat. The words freedom, democracy, security appear again and again, and also a sense of history with the U.S. in the vanguard, leading the West to a better, safer future. And in the case of Truman's address to Congress in 1947, the same year George Kennan crafted his containment policy, a call to action, success secures liberty, failure means enslavement. If there is anything certain today, If there is anything inevitable in the future, it is the will of the people of the world for freedom and for peace. And you can locate the origins of U.S. Cold War interest in Turkey in what would become the Truman Doctrine, that speech in 1947. Turkey, like Greece, needed U.S. aid to avert Soviet domination. Since the war, Turkey has sought additional financial assistance from Great Britain and the United States for the purpose of effecting that modernization necessary for the maintenance of its national integrity. That integrity is essential to the preservation of order in the Middle East. So it was no coincidence that Greece and Turkey in 1952 were the first two nations to join NATO after the original 12 in 1949, the first NATO expansion. West Germany would join in 1955, Portugal in 82, and that was it until 1990 when East Germany reunified with the West in the process expanding NATO a little bit to the East. The Cold War was over. NATO survived. The Warsaw Pact did not. But the world of Harry Truman is long gone, too, and some would argue the post-Cold War world of a unipolar planet led by the United States is a mirage that we have lived for some time in a multipolar world. The United States simply hasn't recognized it yet. We'll return to that subject in a little bit. So when you're listening to these old speeches, such as President George H.W. Bush's remarks in Mainz, Germany in 1989. In the West, we have succeeded because we've been faithful to our values and our vision. But on the other side of the rusting iron curtain, their vision failed. The Cold War began with the division of Europe. It can only end when Europe is whole. It is easy to get lost in the soaring rhetoric, the abstraction of freedom versus communism. 
But no, in every case, they were addressing a specific moment, a certain dilemma that required U.S. leadership in order to keep steering history in the right direction, of course. And we can see where we ended up by looking at a NATO map today versus, say, 1989. It really is amazing to look at that map. Almost all of Europe's in NATO now, or is about to be. In 1999, the former Soviet satellites Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined. Today they are a part of NATO, pledged to defend what was too long denied to them. And then in 2004, nine more countries joined NATO as Russia looked on, powerless to stop it. They endured bitter tyranny. They struggled for independence. They earned their freedom through courage and perseverance. And today they stand with us as full and equal partners in this great alliance. Three of those countries, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, were once part of the Soviet Union, annexed by Stalin in the Second World War. And now history is speeding up again. Finland and Sweden want to join NATO, dropping their decades-long commitment to non-alignment, although both have been NATO partners since the 1990s. But still, this is a big deal. Finland was once part of the Tsarist Empire. It shares an 800-mile-long border with Russia. It fought a war against the invading Soviet Union in 1940 and signed a treaty with the USSR in 1948, establishing its neutrality. Once Finland and Sweden join, NATO will have 32 members, unless its only Asian member blocks them. I think it's conceivable. I can imagine Turkey holding out unless there are real costs uh, levied on Turkey for postponing. I can imagine Turkey holding out for at least a year. Howard Eisenstadt is an expert on Turkish history and politics at St. Lawrence University. Our conversation focusing on the Turkish dynamics here is coming up in a little bit. First, we're going to talk about Finland and Sweden some more and the changing geopolitics of Europe, triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a war of aggression that has renewed NATO's raison d'etre. Timothy Sale is a historian at the University of Toronto, and he is the author of Enduring Alliance, A History of NATO and the Post-War Global Order. Tim Sale, hello. Thanks, Martin. It's great to be with you. Joining us from north of the border. So it is interesting how quickly history can change. A few years ago, NATO was said to be in an identity crisis. What was its purpose? Did the U.S. even want to stay in NATO any longer? Now we have two countries that had never been in NATO, never really wanted to be in NATO, applying for membership. So what are your general thoughts about what we're seeing here, this historic shift? Right. Well, it is like history has sped up all of a sudden with this war in Ukraine. In a war that began with so much discussion about possible NATO expansion, actually is likely going to see NATO expansion, but not where we expected. So Finland and Sweden I think, very likely to join the alliance in the coming months. Months? That quickly? I I think this process, while slow now because of the Turkish opposition and opposition from other states like Croatia has raised some concerns, I think that Sweden and Finland are going to do everything they can to sort of break this logjam. I think there'll be heavy pressure from the larger states in the alliance to uh, resolve Turkish concerns and try and move this forward. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bad thing for NATO. If this membership issue drags and drags, I think that it's in the interest of the alliance and most of the members to have it resolved as soon as possible. Well, historically, the process of actually entering NATO does take time. It's not like signing up for Little League Baseball where you just show up and put your name on a piece of paper. It takes military integration. You have to meet certain standards, if you will. Finland does have a pretty good military. So is that one reason why this can happen so quickly? I think with both Sweden and Finland, these are two states that are really primed to join the alliance. Sweden has been cooperating with NATO for decades. Uh, It was a secret during the Cold War, but not a particularly well-kept secret that Swedish defense plans were carefully coordinated with NATO. Finland in the post-Cold War world has worked closely with NATO too, and and Finnish troops um, have worked uh, alongside NATO troops. So this is not a case of, say, Warsaw Pact militaries that need to be totally re-kitted, re-equipped, that need to have a country redeveloped with new civil military relationships that appease the other states. 
these states are really ready to be slotted into the alliance, and I think it should be extremely easy. So let's begin with Sweden then after World War II, because I think modern listeners, our listeners, in order for them to understand just how big a deal it is for Finland and Sweden to join NATO, they need to know why they remain neutral for so long. Sweden was a neutral power during the war. It did have an important trade relationship with Nazi Germany. Why, after World War II, did Sweden not want to join NATO? Right, yes. So there's a longer term, really a significantly long term tradition of non alignment in Sweden. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, in that during the discussions in the late 1940s about the shape, of what would become NATO. There was real expectation and hope from some of the NATO allies, what would become the NATO allies like the British and the Canadians that Sweden would join. And within Sweden itself, there was a real debate about joining the alliance. And so there were some leaders, some media leaders and others in Sweden who really did want to join the alliance. But Ultimately, this tradition of neutrality held out. It, I think, was the strongest factor. Maybe some concern about how the Soviet Union would react, but it's a little bit more complicated than, let's say, Sweden just always being a neutral state. Well, I was going to ask you, was there pressure from the USSR not to join? Because there was pressure from the USSR on Finland. The Soviet Union and Finland fought a war in 1939, really 1940, the Winter War. And the USSR sought to dominate Finland. That war didn't really go too well for the USSR. They ultimately were able to impose some kind of settlement on the country. How did the end of the Winter War affect immediate Finnish-Soviet relations in the post-war period? Finland was an entirely different position from Sweden and really from all other European states. One of the biggest reasons being the series of wars fought between Finland and the Soviet Union. By the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union had defeated Finland and had managed to extract a number of concessions from the Finns, both in terms of conquered territory, leased territory. The Soviets didn't occupy Finland, but they did have Soviet forces in Finland on bases. And so the Soviet Union was exercising enormous political pressure on Finland to ensure that Finnish foreign and defense policies match Soviet interests. So there was really no question that Finland was going to join NATO. In fact, Finland was one of the countries that the NATO allies looked at when they were creating the treaty as an example of how Soviet political power could be exerted and what they wanted to try and avoid for other states. So Finland, in a way, was sort of a warning case for the alliance. Finland and the Soviet Union signed a treaty in 1948, but this doesn't really make them allies, right? No, that's right. This was a formalization of that informal exercise of Soviet control over Finnish policy. Already, the Soviet Union had compelled the Finns not to accept Marshall Plan money, for instance. And the stipulations were... Well, Finland wouldn't join NATO. It would remain neutral in the Cold War. It wouldn't allow its territory to be used to launch an attack against the Soviet Union. That's exactly right. And the treaty was written with reference to Germany possibly invading the Soviet Union. But that really came to stand in for Germany's allies and especially the United States-backed NATO. So Sweden and Finland in 1949, when NATO is formed, remain neutral. Do they remain strictly neutral throughout the Cold War? In other words, do they begin to drift one way or the other to the West or to the East? Sweden definitely does begin to lean to the West over the course of the Cold War. And there are secret relationships and meetings between Swedish defense officials and NATO defense officials from the 1960s onward, sort of an open secret that Sweden is uh, connected with NATO, even if not a formal ally. Finland is entirely different. Finland and Finnish leaders do everything they can to make sure that the Soviet Union has no reason to believe that Finland is is tilting to the West. They have an 800-mile border with the Soviet Union, so they had reason to want to placate them. So we said in 1949, Sweden and Finland do not join NATO. Turkey does in 1952. Take a look at a map. 
Turkey is not in Western Europe. So how does it wind up in NATO? Of course, we talk about NATO, and it is called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And there are elements of the treaty that restrict membership and new members to being in Europe. But NATO is not a regional defense arrangement in a very technical way. When NATO was created, when the, the treaty was created, the diplomats who created it purposefully did not draft it in a way that met Actually, it's Article 54 of the United Nations Charter for Regional Defense Organizations. Mm -hmm. Instead, it was simply a self-defense organization. And any of the geographical limits put on NATO are really just the product of agreement between the allies. So NATO actually came to be called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in, in an obscure way. There was worry that the governments of Australia would come under political pressure at home if this was called, say, the Democracy Treaty Organization or something. So the name North Atlantic Treaty Organization was a tool to try and protect some other allied governments around the world. So the treaty really is open in a sense and that it's not restricted just to the North Atlantic, and, I, and that's counterintuitive given its name. And so Italy does join NATO in 1945. It's not on the North Atlantic, but it does raise questions about the defense of this alliance. And from Italy, we can see on the map the importance of Greece. Yes. And then we can see the importance of Turkey. So yeah. Greece and Turkey a, both join in 52. Right, right. And they will be allies who, who have a very difficult relationship with each other, despite being part of the same alliance. So 1952, Greece and Turkey do join the treaty. They both wanted to join the treaty and had sought to join NATO. In 1949, the idea of Greece and Turkey joining NATO were discussed. It wasn't clear whether it would be possible. What was clear in 1949 was that if Greece and Turkey were going to join NATO, it would have to be later after the alliance had at least had a couple of years of existence to sort of build some patterns and habits. Turkey, though, is a majorly important geographical era, area in the Cold War. It's a military power. And as I said, it's a state that wants to join NATO. Turkey saw real benefits both for its own protection from the Soviet Union, but also the defense assistance uh, and modernization that would come with NATO. And so there are actually diplomatic records in the archives where you can see Turkish diplomats hinting to the allies that Turkey needs a home in the Cold War, and that they want it to be NATO. But if it's not going to be NATO, perhaps they need to look somewhere else. So there is a real back and forth and negotiation that ultimately ends up with Turkey and Greece joining NATO, significantly expanding NATO territory and military power. Isn't the Truman Doctrine a factor here? Absolutely. This is a crucial area geographically in the Cold War. The road from the Truman Doctrine in the 1940s to, to Turkey joining the alliance is bumpy. There, there were different possibilities, and American diplomats had different ideas as to how they could link Greece and Turkey to the defense of the West that maybe didn't include NATO membership. But ultimately, since the Turks and the Greeks wanted it, there was a military rationale for it. It did come to be. Containment, right? The U.S. needed to have missiles and an air base in Turkey. That air base is still there. I want to talk about it. This was about containment and having strategic positioning to contain the USSR. Right, absolutely. There's the sort of George Kennan-esque logic of containment, of protecting key industrial areas. And the best way to protect the heartland of Europe is to ensure that this landmass of Turkey is part of your alliance, or at least on your side. But on a less grand strategic basis and on a military basis, Turkey provided a launching pad. And I mean that figuratively, but of course, it does come to be a literal possible launching pad for NATO forces in a war against the Soviet Union. When Turkey joined NATO... NATO and American war plans envisioned a war that looked much more like the Second World War than just a pure nuclear exchange. So the territory and land forces of Turkey were major elements in strengthening Western defense. Well, we know the Soviet Union didn't appreciate the presence of U.S. missiles in Turkey because in order to resolve the Cuban Missile Crisis, didn't JFK secretly or quietly remove the Polaris missiles? 
Jupiter missiles. Jupiter uh, missiles. Th- there were Jupiter missiles in Italy and in Turkey. And it's something the United States and the Kennedy administration tried to keep secret, but it's it's really an open secret that the United States promised to withdraw those intermediate range ballistic missiles from Turkey and Italy in exchange for the Soviet Union withdrawing its missiles from Cuba. It's just worth noting that those missiles were really near the end of their life. They either had to be modernized or replaced anyway. So the Americans got quite a good deal. And the United States would go on to base other types of nuclear weapons in Turkey Anyway, I'm not sure where I got the word Polaris from. So thank you for reminding it's me. It's another that. missile. It's another, yeah. You're good. Right era. Different so missile. I think we've established why Turkey did join. It wanted to, but the U.S. also had its own needs there. So Cold War over, 1991, collapse of the Soviet Union. Since that time, we see that other, many other small, Militarily weak countries have joined NATO. Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, Slovenia. Was there ever in the post-Cold War period any talk of Sweden joining the alliance after the collapse of the Soviet Union? Were the Swedes still simply not interested or didn't see a need for it? Yes, I think it's most likely the latter in that there really was not a pressing need in the 1990s, especially, or into the 2000s for for Sweden to have this formal role. Again, the Swedish-NATO defense relationship had existed before the end of the Cold War, and it continued on. And so Sweden, the Swedish military regularly worked with NATO militaries. But the idea that the state of Sweden needed an alliance in case it was attacked, you know, was not on anyone's radar in the 1990s. I do think it was on Sweden's radar before this year, however, and increasingly in the last five, six, seven years, we have seen Russia use military signals against Sweden with Russian submarines popping up on the Swedish coast and so on. So that relationship has become more tense uh, more recently, but it's a, a relatively recent phenomenon. And as far as Finland goes after the Cold War, I mean, it's it maintained the same relationship with Russia that it had with the USSR, right? That's right. Although the one thing I would add that continued, but is an important corollary to that, is the continued development and strength of the Finnish military, the continued reliance on conscription, the spending on weapons. Finland, despite working to maintain happy diplomatic relations uh, with neighbors on all sides, was something of a porcupine, really making sure that it didn't give in to any peace dividend at the end of the Cold War. You know, it just occurred to me, too, that Finland has a historic relationship. Well, we talked a little bit about it with the Soviet Union and the war, the Winter War and the shared border, has a unique relationship to Russia, just as Ukraine has a a unique relationship to Russia. When it comes to this issue of alliances, Finland was part of the old czarist empire. Was that a factor at all in here? We know that because of Ukraine's membership of the Soviet Union, it was an SSR and also it had been part of czarist Russia greater Russia, that it's a very prickly issue there. What about Finland and its historic relationship with Russia? Did that bear on any of these decisions? Yes, it does bear on this because the Russians, and by this I mean the Russian Empire, had fears that Finnish territory could be an avenue into Russia in case of war. And the Second World War, in some ways, bore that out. So while in 1939, it's the Soviets who attack Finland, in the 1940s, it's Finnish troops moving east that help pin down some Soviet forces while the German forces move into encircle cities in northern, northwestern Russia. So the same fears and concerns that the Russian Empire and Tsarist days had about Finnish territory uh, were revealed in the Soviet era. Now, of course, it's almost impossible for me to imagine Western forces rolling through full yes. through Finland east into Russia. But it doesn't mean that the idea is impossible or that it's just suddenly disappeared, especially when it's been around for so long. So after the Cold War, especially after 9-11, Turkey's relationship with the United States and the West becomes increasingly strained. It's not very good today. What's going on there? What has happened? Yes, there's a difficult relationship 
between NATO and Turkey, also some of the NATO allies and Turkey. I think these come up really more for geopolitical reasons than simply ideological reasons or, or political governance reasons. I think too often people who are interested in NATO like me think primarily about Turkey as a NATO ally, and we don't give enough attention to Turkey's interests beyond NATO. As we saw the Middle East come to be really a battleground in the 2000s, Turkey made some difficult decisions. And, and one of them, of course, being a refusal to allow American troops to transit through Turkey into Iraq in, in 2003. We've seen a difference between Turkey and some of the other NATO allies, some serious differences as to the political future of the Kurds that had an impact on the fight against ISIS. So Turkish geopolitical interests in the Middle East just haven't, and, and maybe we shouldn't expect them to closely align with some of the NATO allies' interests in the Middle East. And that's led to, to real frictions in the alliance. Our thanks to Timothy Sale, University of Toronto. So now we're going to further sharpen our focus on Turkey and its objection to Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Turkish President Recep Erdogan says the two Nordic countries are harboring Kurdish terrorists. He means the Kurdish Workers' Party, or PKK. That's a separatist movement that has been fighting Turkish forces since the 1980s. In fact, since 1984, between 30 and 40,000 people are estimated to have died in fighting between the PKK and the Turkish government. That stat cited in an article at CNBC.com. Now, Sweden, of course, denies it is harboring terrorists. It is home to many Kurds who are not in the PKK, but Turkey lumps them in with the group anyway. That same article says the Swedish government has supported members of other Kurdish organizations, such as the political wing of the PKK's Syrian branch, called the PYD. Sweden says they're different, but Turkey says they're all the same. Howard Eisenstadt, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Martin. Great to be with you again. About a year already since our first conversation when we talked about President Biden recognizing the Armenian genocide. Turkey back in the news because of its objection to Finland and Sweden potentially joining NATO. So the stated reason for Turkey's opposition is that Sweden especially, but also Finland, harbor Kurdish terrorists, is how they frame it, members of the PKK, which has been at war with Turkey for the better part of the past three, four decades, right? Is there more to it than that? And if so, what? I think there is. I think that certainly Turkey has beefs, particularly with Sweden, less so with Finland, over dissidents and refugees that Turkey claims are, are terrorists. They have concerns about Sweden's support for the YPG. They have concerns about Sweden's embargo on military sales to Turkey. But all of those things are true for most of Turkey's NATO allies. And in other words, most of the complaints that they're levying at Sweden and Finland are true for, for other countries and, and maybe even particularly true for the United States. I think that what Turkey is really doing, it's reminding its NATO allies that it has its own security concerns, that it is an important player, and that it can be a spoiler if its concerns aren't met. Do you believe that ultimately Turkey will try to hold this up for a while? I mean, we've seen in the past, for instance, Greece held up Macedonia's entrance into NATO until they agreed to change the name of the country, is now North Macedonia. Do you think Turkey might do this for a while? I think it's conceivable. I can imagine Turkey holding out, unless there are real costs uh, levied on Turkey for postponing, I can imagine Turkey holding out for at least a year. There are expected to be new elections in June of 2023. I can imagine Turkey sort of holding out until after those elections and then packaging support for Sweden and Finland as some sort of reset post-elections. But it could also happen tomorrow if there's creativity and Turkey starts to see that there's costs as well as benefits to this equation. I think that Turkey has seen it thus far as a cost-free strategy. Well, at this moment anyway, the Erdogan government 
is demanding that Sweden hand over well, an entire list of people that Turkey views as terrorists. But Sweden and Finland have both categorized, if you will, the PKK as a terrorist organization. They ban it from their country. There seems to be a disagreement over who is a terrorist here. If you're somewhat affiliated with the PKK or if you're just simply a Kurdish opposition figure. Well, and, and it goes beyond Kurdish opposition figures to other people that Turkey has targeted. In the end, there are extradition uh, processes. Turkey hasn't met the level of evidence needed to extradite these individuals. They have received refugee status. There's no reasonable expectation that any of these people will be extradited to Turkey. If the Swedish or Finnish government were were inclined to do so, the Swedish and Finnish courts would, would kibosh it very quickly. Many people in the U.S. may not be aware of just how many Kurdish people live in Sweden. It's about a 100,000, if I'm not mistaken. There are Kurds in the Swedish parliament. So this is no easy matter. No. And, and I, w- I would underline, these are the same sorts of complaints and tensions that Turkey has with the United States. The exact sort of debates going on and the exact same sort of problem. Turkey hasn't offered evidence of direct individual culpability, and the cases have simply not moved forward. I want you to tell me if I'm getting this right, the way I'm reading Turkey's objection. You know, for decades, the United States, right from the end of the Cold War to present, has always said Russia cannot have a veto over NATO enlargement. In essence, NATO would serve as an arm of U.S. foreign policy. But now Turkey is saying, wait, hold on a second. We matter, too. We're a large country. We have helped the United States many times over the years in the war on terrorism, for instance. We're a militarily strong country. It's not all about Western Europe anymore. We live in a multipolar world. Am I reading that right? I think you are. I I mean, I would say that NATO from the end of the Cold War until the Russian invasion of Ukraine, NATO was an alliance, a structure. There was this great structure. There was this great alliance but its purpose wasn't really clear. It's now an anti-Russian alliance. And from Turkey's perspective, first of all, is that the only thing that NATO should be, right? Turkey has its own security concerns. And secondly, I'm not sure that Turkey wants to to see NATO as an anti-Russian alliance. Turkey has a a complicated uh, relationship with Russia, but it would like to keep those relations working, it does not want to see a return to sort of that bifurcated relationship that we had during the Cold War. So Turkey wants to remain, as far as we can tell, when I say Turkey, uh, the political elites, the military wants to remain inside NATO, but at the same time doesn't want to alienate Russia. And we know that Turkey bought a missile system from Russia when it couldn't get what it wanted from the West, right? Yeah, I would tweak that a little bit. They chose to take a Russian system. There were multiple systems available that they could have bought from Western powers. They chose to buy the Russian system. They did it very consciously. They believed that it would give them a greater strategic flexibility. They believed that they were making a political statement. They were making a political statement, but it's had tremendous costs for them. And it raises the immediate question of how can you be in NATO and be integrated in a Western military system and have Russian military hardware? I'm no military expert, but that sounds a little off to me. Yeah, it's other countries have purchased Russian arms before other countries. Obviously, the NATO members that are post-Soviet have plenty of old Soviet hardware that they're still using. But the purchase of the S-400s in particular was seen as threatening. And that's that's why uh, the United States sanctioned Turkey for purchasing them. That's a good point about the former Eastern Bloc countries. Apparently, that old Soviet equipment still works. <laughs> so to history, for those who are unaware of the Kurds' place in Turkish history, Middle Eastern history. The Kurds are a nation of people without a state. And they live in Turkey, they live in Iraq, they live in other places, they have their own language, they have their own culture. This is a big question to take on, but we can just go with a 20th century 
early 20th century. Why is there no Kurdistan and why does that matter in Turkey's view? Um, that's a great question. Yeah. I, I Entire think, books have been written about it. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that there have been proto-Kurdish states at various times. One could argue that there's sort of a, a nascent Kurdish state in northern Iraq under the KRG, the Kurdish regional government. One could argue that the YPG in northern Syria represents that as well. There was an attempt immediately after World War II to create a Kurdish state in Iran that was quashed, actually, with U.S. aid. In the case of Turkey, Kurds, there, there were certainly Kurdish nationalists, but most uh, Kurds saw themselves as part of a Muslim whole. They didn't see the creation of Turkey as necessarily antagonistic to them until a few years down the line, once the Turkish national state started to impose new rules and regulations on them, started to centralize, and, and then you start to see the beginnings of a much more self-conscious Kurdish nationalism. There are about 30 million Kurds in the world, just to provide some details here. They're mostly Sunni Muslim. About 20% of Turkey's population of 84 million people is Kurdish. So many millions of Kurds live in Turkey. I think I mentioned mostly in the southeastern part of the country. But because they don't have their own state, some who have pushed for Kurdish autonomy or statehood have done so with violence, and that would be the PKK, to kind of bring us to present. So... To answer the question, why do the Kurds matter to Turkey and this business with Finland and Sweden? I mean, some of the answers are right there, right? I'm not certain that the Kurds, to take the question apart a little bit, I think the issue of potential Kurdish nationalism is a longstanding and central concern of the Turkish government. And I think that would be true regardless of who is in power. That said, I don't think that the issue of Kurds is necessarily central to what Turkey is doing with Finland and Sweden right now. What Finland and Sweden have done isn't out of line with what other countries in the EU have done. It isn't out of line with what the United States has done. I think that Turkey has chosen to focus on these issues because they're sort of longstanding grievances. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily the core of what Turkey's doing with NATO right now. I think what Turkey's doing right now is demonstrating its importance and showing Western allies its needs must be met. I think that's a good point. But it is one more layer of tension on top of some previous, we'll call them incidents or controversies, that Turkey was not able to resolve to its satisfaction. For instance, Kurdish fighters in Syria, who were linked to the PKK, who were fighting ISIS, were getting weapons and support from the U.S. and Europe. Turkey was unhappy with that. And are. Yes. And are, right? And they remain our allies in Syria. So what are some of the reasons Turkey has drifted closer to Russia in recent years? I think that Turkey... I don't think there's any indication that Turkey wants to leave NATO or or remove itself from those structures. But I think that Turkey, uh, like a lot of countries, has looked at the strategic landscape uh, since, you can say, the last 10, 15 years and has has decided that the United States is not simply... We're not simply moving from sort of a unipolar to, to a multipolar world, but we're, we're also seeing the United States withdraw its energies from the Middle East. And that provides both strategic risks and strategic opportunities that Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, even Israel have looked to reposition themselves. It's, I, I think it's fair to note that none of our Middle Eastern allies have been as forthcoming in their support for the West in its struggle with over Ukraine as we might have hoped they would be, as we might have expected them to be. Turkey has criticized Russia for the invasion, but it has not joined in on the sanctions. So it seems no, like, yeah. it, it is not. A company very close to the Turkish government has sold Ukraine drones, and those have, have been famously successful on the battlefield. It is 
closed the Straits of Montreux, or it's, I'm sorry, it, under the Montreux Agreement, has closed the Turkish Straits. It has limited Russian flights from Syria or to Syria over Turkish territory. So it's done some things, some important things, but by and large, it's recruiting Russian tourists. It is making it very easy for Russian oligarchs to set up shop in Turkey. It has created safe haven. And one can imagine that Turkey, in its opposition to Finland and Sweden joining the NATO, was also thinking about how this would play in Moscow. There's a question in Russia, in Russian history, that doesn't seem to have one answer. And that is, is Russia part of Europe or Asia? Is that question alive in Turkey? Yeah, I think it is. And I think the answer to that in both cases is, is well, yes and no. Both for Russia and for for Turkey, there are ways in which they are fully part of the Western tradition and ways that they are not. I think that Turkey, in its current strategic thinking, believes that it's moving into a multipolar world where it has every interest in both maintaining its ties to the West and building out towards Russia, towards China, towards Pakistan, towards India, to create a country that is uh, truly a global power rather than merely a regional one. I was reading an article in the National Review the other day. It was an opinion piece that said, Turkey's not really a democracy anymore, so why is it even in NATO? Then I read something else that Erdogan might lose the coming election. So if they're having elections, that would mean that they are a democracy in some form. Help me figure this out, Howard. Well, I think a lot rides on that election. Erdogan is less popular now than he has been ever before. Turkey is, it has elections. The count has typically been fair, but the mechanics around the election have not necessarily been. I think parallels to Hungary are probably useful there. Control of the media, similarly, uh, this would be like, you know, 90% of the media being owned by Fox or 90% of the media being MSNBC. It's a controlled media environment. So, Elections have been sort of fair, but lots of sort of rigging of the system in advance because the country has largely been a 50-50 sort of electoral balance. The amount of rigging that was there was enough to consistently give Erdogan power. The question is, is the kind of rigging that's occurred up to this point sufficient for the level of unpopularity that Erdogan suffers under now, I think that experts disagree as to whether the opposition has a real chance or not. I do think that most people, including most people in the opposition, believe that the next elections are the opposition's last best hope for resting control of the country. Well, is Erdogan, in your view, a small d Democrat or is he something else? Uh an illiberal populist, an autocrat? I think that he sees himself as a Democrat, but he also believes that the system is rigged in democracy. So like, he doesn't believe that the press in the United States or Germany is really free. And so he sees no problem with pressuring the media in his own country. He has a very basic sense of elections. And, and this is This is why I'm not sure what's going to happen in the next election, because while he's been willing to to sort of cheat at the edges, he has not yet had to cheat in sort of the big ways. He hasn't had to, like, overturn an election in a dramatic way. And when push comes down to shove, we don't know what he's going to do yet. What you're saying here reminds me of what has been said about Hungary under Orban. He is still winning clear majorities of the vote. But if there were a really close election, he might be able to, because of the way Hungary has become more, let's say, autocratic rather than democratic, put his thumb on the scales to tilt it in his favor. So about Turkey and Erdogan, it's been said that some of his opposition, and not just him, but Turkish nationalists opposing Sweden and Finland because of 
domestic politics, right? They're unpopular at home. And that's something we always miss here in the United States when we view other countries' foreign policies, how much it has to do with domestic politics. So maybe this is nothing more than that, that he's using this as a boost before an election, knowing that in the end he can't or won't keep those two countries out of NATO. He can actually keep them out of NATO. Uh, I mean, yes, he can, but we'll decide maybe not to ultimately. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think that there are certainly scholars who believe that this is mostly domestic politics. I don't think that that's true, but I do think that this plays well domestically and that doesn't hurt. Right. There's there's no politician alive anywhere in the world who's unhappy when what they think is the right policy also happens to be the politically savvy policy, the, the popular policy. And I think that's the case right now yeah. with Turkey. And given the history here, I mean, Erdogan is saying those countries are harboring our enemies. If his concerns were really practical and were really about the stated things, this would have been handled quietly in the corridors in Brussels. Turkey would have gotten something in return and it would have all gone away without anybody noticing. That's how things normally get handled in NATO. Erdogan has instead made this as big and as loud as possible. I think part of the reason for that is domestic politics. I think part of the reason for that is he wants the crisis. The role of disruptor from his perspective is one that gives benefits without significant costs. I want to thank you for clearly answering my cluttered questions. (laughs) It's great to be with you, Mark. We thank Howard Eisenstadt and Timothy Sale for helping us answer the NATO question. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to return to the subject of the Supreme Court. You know, in the brouhaha over the leaked ruling in the Dobbs case to overturn Roe v. Wade, I started to think why the Supreme Court has always been such an important American institution and how often it's got things totally wrong going to go back to the Dred Scott case and more with Akil Amar next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from the Washington Times. 